Dear Case. Dear Tom. Dear Amy. You're 18 years old, getting ready for senior prom. For the first time in your life, you feel confident. You've overcome loss and depression and are now starting your junior year at a new high school. You've had a really good life. A loving wife, two terrific kids. You're so proud of them. You are not prepared for what you're about to face. You will now mark all of your life by what happened before and after April 20th, 1999. Tuesday morning, you'll meet with Dave Sanders, your basketball coach and mentor, to discuss a college scholarship offer. He'll say, you have so much heart, Amy. I knew you could do it. Instead of heading home for lunch as always, you will end up in the school library. I am a teacher at Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. Two hours later, you'll find yourself hiding from gunshots under a cafeteria table. On the floor! Stay on the floor! Is there any way you can lock the doors? As you crouch in fear with your classmates, you see Coach telling us to run to get out. As you look back, you will see your coach for the last time. School violence erupted again today, this time in Colorado. You'll be at work watching the news coverage. The shooting broke out just before lunch. But we'll be in denial that something bad could happen to Daniel until hours pass with no word from him. Big gunshot and a teacher ran by. You will hide under a computer desk, quietly pleading with God to save you. You'll simultaneously feel the gut punch of evil as the shooters enter the library and a strong, invisible hand on your shoulder providing an unexplainable peace. A slug from a shotgun fired at close range will turn the bones in your shoulder, arm, and hand to dust and burn a path across the front of your throat. You will have the clarity of mind to slump down and pretend you are dead. Coach Sanders and 12 students won't make it out. You'll get out safely. Your wounds are invisible. The day will stretch into two, as it will take nearly 24 hours to be officially notified that your only son was one of the students killed. You will face a parent's worst nightmare, the loss of a child. Stay strong, it won't be easy. You struggle in the aftermath, feeling guilty that you survived. Your sense of safety and trust has been stolen from you. You can't sit with your back to an exit. You fall to the ground in fear when you hear loud noises. Now you're the girl from Columbine, broken. Your coach is gone, basketball isn't the same, and you're not the same. Trust your gut, get help. Start putting yourself back together before you move on. You will find inspiration in Daniel. You will remember how he was so very shy, yet chose to join the debate team. You will start wearing his shoes to symbolize how you too can overcome your shyness and join this great debate about making stronger gun laws. We need to have change, that enough is enough. And I think we're gonna see Daniel's wish. You will make sure the world remembers the victims, not the killers. Daniel Mauser was only 15 years old when he was gunned down at Columbine. He was an amazing kid. Your survival will be miraculous. A team of doctors will create a one-of-a-kind plan to use donated cadaver bones to save your arm from amputation. Still, your now disabled body and mind will cause pain, PTSD, and paranoia. You have thrived after difficult circumstances before. You can do so again. You'll have two beautiful children and be married to the love of your life. He'll show you a path forward, even when you couldn't see one, and you'll walk it together. The first time you drop your daughter off at school, you'll have a panic attack, fearing she too will not be safe in the classroom. It's a chronic disorder you'll battle for years. Tell your kids not to worry. We can't live our lives in fear. You will make Daniel proud. <laughs> Adopting a baby girl from China giving the time you would have given to him to another child and bring healing to your family. You will marry your Prince Charming and welcome four beautiful babies into your family. Own your story. 
You'll travel around the country, share your story, and help others like the kids from Parkland and Paducah. You will learn to use your story as a public speaker and author to encourage others and to advocate for bone and tissue donation. 20 years later, you will now face a painful anniversary. This one day is just so much more painful, a day you just can't wait to pass. Yet you will look back and be pleased with what you've done to keep his memory alive. When you speak publicly, you will wear Daniel's old Vans shoes, the very ones he was wearing on April 20th, 1999. Take solace in the fact you will proudly walk in Daniel's shoes for the rest of your life. I will leave a lot on. Persevere, ask for help, and embrace love and empathy. It will allow you to move beyond life's difficult moments and reach the beautiful ones. Continue to be brave. Choose freedom from fear. Do not allow the troubles in your life to hold your heart and mind. The journey will be tough, but you will not only survive, you'll thrive. Cause I will leave the light on. On that day in 1999, Craig Scott's sister Rachel was the first person killed. Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Craig is seeing Amanda Stare for the first time since evacuating the school 20 years ago. You doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Heather Martin formed the Rebels Project, a group that goes to the scene of mass shootings to assist. Michelle Wheeler now teaches middle school English in the district and has never spoken publicly about that day. Frank DeAngelis was the principal. He continued to serve in the job for another 15 years, a promise to see every student who was in the system at the time of the shooting through graduation. Show of hands, how many of you think about it every day? All of you. Every morning when I wake up, uh, as soon as I get out of bed, I recite the names of my beloved 13. How many of you, show of hands, still ask why? None of you. Why is that? We've all been there. We've all been at that point where we're just angry at the world. I also think it's a question that can never be answered. We don't know why they did what they did. So you stopped trying to wonder? Well, I mean, I've forgiven them. I think that they lost their lives way before the 20th. I think they were very broken souls. There's nothing I would get out of knowing why. Michelle, you haven't spoken about this publicly. No. Since. Right. You have a 13-year-old. Mm -hmm. How does that impact the way you raise her? And um, <clears throat> I started telling her about the shooting when she was five and going into kindergarten. Um, and I started very developmentally appropriate, just saying, Mommy's sad that her friends are in heaven. And then as she got older, I started to tell her a little bit more. The hardest day of my life was sending her to kindergarten. Um, I ended up in Mr. Frank DeAngelis' office um, in tears. I had no idea what I was doing, why I was letting her go. And every day still is a struggle. You know, every day um, I make sure I say I love you, and then I am so excited when she gets back into my car at the end of the day. Do you think about where she can get out places, exits? Um, we'll be in the doctor's office or King Supers or somewhere, and I'll say, show me five places where you'll hide because it could happen anywhere, and I want her to be prepared. Um, and I think it makes me feel prepared. While Michelle raises her daughter and teaches in the district, Heather frequently travels outside it. The Rebels Project, we really focus in long term because, you know, after an event, all the help in the world is focused on that one area. And it's really after the cameras go away that people start to feel that isolation and start to feel that loneliness. So our outreach doesn't start until you know, sometimes months after the event. Do you still feel the isolation and loneliness? I don't feel the isolation anymore. I know I'm not alone. Craig Scott formed a group called uh, Value Up, which that. teaches kids about respect. He's had kids acknowledge terrible why. thoughts. One even handed him uh, a hit list. He handed you a hit list. Yeah, uh, over the years, my family and I, we've seen uh, over a dozen documented school shootings prevented from sharing really the story of my sister. What are you trying to tell kids these days? I meet so many kids that um, 
are uh, feeling disconnected or don't feel they're, they're valuable. When I learned about the shooters at Columbine, I saw in their journals a real self-hatred, that they didn't value themselves. And if you were to ask me the biggest reason that Columbine happened, it wasn't uh, bullying at our school, it wasn't uh, the medication they were on, it wasn't the lack of gun control, it wasn't uh, that our, our, our school was a bad place or bad parenting. The biggest reason I tell kids that Columbine happened was that the shooters focused on everything that was negative in this world. If there's one thing you want people to know 20 years later, what is it? What Columbine represents, when I speak to the communities from Parkland and Santa Fe and Sandy Hook, I said Columbine represents hope. And even though the road's going to be tough, it's going to be a tough journey and you're going to be kicked down, you got to get back up. And we're all there. And we're all part of this club and we could all help each other. But I truly believe that the Columbine community is stronger today than what it was almost 20 years ago. And we provide hope for others. Tom Mauser's life is about the before and after. Those years before Columbine, you know, it was family life, it was normal. After Columbine, it's grieving, it's pain, it's life without a key member of your family. His son Daniel was 15, one of 12 students and a teacher who were killed in the mass shooting at Columbine High School. When, when you have a tragedy like this happen, it's like an earthquake and you have those waves going out. We were there in the epicenter. Do you feel as though this has defined you? I think it, I do feel that it's defined me. That it is what, the, the, the key event of my life. Just two weeks before the massacre, Daniel had brought up the issue of loopholes in gun control. They did not kill their spirits. After his death, that conversation drove his father to a new mission in life. How could I not react to that? How could I not respond and do something to honor him? Mauser has worked for two decades to strengthen gun laws and institute stricter background checks. I feel that we still have a lot of people who are in denial, who think that it wouldn't happen to them. Just like I didn't think it would happen to me. They think that somehow this problem will take care of itself. Well, it hasn't and it won't. The work has helped him move forward. So has his family. A year after Daniel's death, the Mausers adopted a baby girl from China. On special occasions, he wears the shoes his son wore the day he died. You feel his presence? I do. I, I, I feel that it gives me strength um, to take on anything. Daniel's gentle spirit and shy grin are memorialized near the high school, where mourners still remember the senseless violence that changed this community forever. Kenneth Craig, CBS News, Littleton, Colorado. Whoever said time heals all wounds couldn't have imagined a wound as gaping as Columbine. But unlike so many tales from that day, this one begins on a happy note. I love you briskly like an impala. Hello? Josh Lamb, a sophomore at Columbine all those years ago, he is now a husband and father of two, Stetson and JJ. I was always looking for something good, trying to find the silver lining. Did you find it? I think I did. I have a happy family. <laughs> is that outside or downstairs? Downstairs. downstairs. Josh's dad, Randy, is also beaming. He's the proud grandfather, after all. It's a home full of light and laughter. Are you doing okay? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. 20 years ago, it was anything but. It's hard saying that your 16-year-old son should see something that nobody should ever see. We remember that day like yesterday, or I do anyway. It was just a day after the Columbine massacre when 48 Hours correspondent Bill Lagatuda caught up with Josh and his dad. What did you think was happening? I was so scared I just ran underneath my desk. Josh hadn't seen that interview since the day it aired. When they first walked in, they said, any jocks stand up? His wife, Ashley, had never seen it. It just breaks my heart for him. It makes the tears roll again. I know you're afraid, but what's going through your mind? Um, I was waiting for a sharp pain just to hit me. Um, you know, I would close my eyes, cross my fingers, and you know, talk to God. 
Some of it I remember, some of it I don't. The um, sharp pain in the side. Why that, out of everything that happened, seems to stick out so much? Probably because that's what I really expected. Ten students were murdered just feet away from him in Columbine's library that day. Not an experience that exactly fades. You really didn't want to talk about it at first, right? No. Um, not at all. My parents kind of <laughs> kind of forced me. Yeah, I told him if we had to take him to every counselor in the state until they found one he liked, he was going whether he wanted to or not. Can you tell when he's gone to sort of a dark place? Yeah, I, I try to check in with him a lot. I try to be, like, proactive in, in giving him a safe space to talk about it. All that talking has helped ease the past. But what about the future? How's being a dad changed how you think about all this? It scares me. Just the thought of your kids going to school. In my heart, it scares me. My brain, it tells me it's slim to, you know, the chances of it happening are super slim, and I understand that, but my heart says, should they? <laughs> I don't know if I can handle it. I, I honestly don't. Gives you a sense, though, I guess, of what your dad went through that day. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. You were raw then, and it's still raw. It's your kid, it's your son, why? That why is still unanswered. It's never answered, really, in the wake of any mass shooting. But for all those survivors, Josh has a message. If I can be a voice to tell them it'll get better, it'll never go away, it'll get easier, I'm willing to be that voice in some way. No. Time doesn't heal much, but it does offer perspective. For CBS This Morning, Lee Cowan, Denver. They don't. Mountains rising. On a sunny Colorado afternoon, they came to listen, remember, and support each other on a difficult day. Hope did not die, evil did not have the last word, and people have been able to move forward with great faith and with great hope. 20 years ago, two students opened fire, and Columbine went from just another suburban Denver school to a name that now means mass murder. Here at the memorial for those who were killed and at the service, there was another message, hope that this community can stay together to help those who are still healing. As Kiki Labot will tell you, healing is hard. He was a first year teacher when the shooting started. He still teaches here. You were there 20 years, and yet there's still pain in your voice. You know, trauma has memory, and uh, we, can, we can feel it. Memories that come back on days like this anniversary, not just here, but for victims of other school shootings. Steve Siegel knows he was a victim's advocate for the Denver District Attorney. He helped survivors from Columbine, the Aurora Theater Massacre, the Boston Marathon bomb. What are they suffering? They're going through a, a time where their wounds have been ripped open. It's flooding back in. Kiki was invited by the staff at Sandy Hook Elementary School to meet them after that shooting. It's a really important part of that healing to have that opportunity to meet with somebody or talk to somebody who can relate to your experience. But I really kind of wonder if we should always keep this going on to remember what happened and what the lessons were. We really need to keep the dialogue. And the dialogue means the memories. Yeah, the memories. I mean, that's part of it. It's part of what we have to deal with until something changes. This is a ceremony of remembrance. It's about a half a mile from Columbine High School. Just like 20 years ago, there is sadness here. But just like 20 years ago, the community comes together to help those who still need to heal. Barry Peterson, CBS News, Littleton, Colorado. I feel like I always want to take a second to remember what happened, because that's what I associate with this day. And I remember being on lockdown in elementary school and like everything, just not knowing anything that was going on. And I can't even imagine 
anyway, we thought we should probably stop by. I've never been here on the actual anniversary, so it's really hitting me more than it has before. Thinking of their loved ones today, family, friends, mothers, fathers. I pray that you would bless them. I pray that you would bring comfort and healing. And I pray that for Kyle Velasquez, Rachel Scott, Dan Rorbel, Matt Fexter, Holly Fleming, they come today to remember. Whatever they need to do, just bless. Help, help. When I heard it, it was just a complete opposite person than what I remember him as. Like, I remember him as a nice, quiet person who had a lot of friends, and just everything about, like, what they said is, like, complete opposite of, like, how he was when I knew him. No interest in weapons, no interest... Like, I, because I took out my yearbook and I compared pictures, and sure enough, it was him, and I, I couldn't believe it. I think, this would have been the same person? I think he would be the same person as we are. Like, he would be, I don't think that he would have been, like, wrapped up in what happened out there. I think he would, you know, stay the same, like, as we are, like, still be, you know, this, the same, like, person, you know, liking sports, liking the Rockies, um, smart in school, and not, you know, change. Now, you guys all went on a whaling trip together, and what was he like on that trip? His just, a, I mean, a normal kid. He was a little, all the guys were kind of troublemakers, but he even seemed tentative to do things like that. He was pretty quiet. But. So he was never even an instigator, no. basically. But what, what do you think about what happened later on? I just, I was in shock. I mean, I saw, his, I saw his picture and I recognized him. And knowing Eric the way that I knew him, I never pictured him violent. Or, and I just couldn't believe that he would do something like this. And I think, I think sometimes today, like, he talked to you about that. And, he had friends, but just not the, I don't think his, his friends were very supportive of him. I don't think that they gave him positive support, and I think that he just he turned into something that he wouldn't have turned into if he stayed here. So he didn't get enough support. Can you tell us what she's told you about that? They shot, um, Val was hit um, at that point, and she grabbed her abdomen, kind of had fallen forward out from under the table, and was um, you know, crying, oh my God, oh my God, don't let me die. And they asked her if she believed in God. They said, God, do you believe in God? And she said, yes. 
she was half scared to say say yes because they were reloading and she knew she was probably going to get it again and but knowing that she couldn't say no and deny her faith and um, that was a real uh, difficult point for her and I'm really proud of her for standing up and saying what what she believes in and um, she crawled back under the table saying she said I think I'm dying and she kind of crawled back under the table and whether they thought she was wounded enough that she was gonna die they turned and left and um, after they left the library somebody yelled uh, it's they left you know they left everybody get out the exits and you know she tried to wake her friend up and her friend wouldn't wake up and she said mommy I just tried so hard to wake her up and she wouldn't wake up I'm sorry Mark, Sherry, I just don't know how many of us as adults would have the courage to stand up for something like your faith when you know what can happen to you. Yeah, it's, you never know. I mean, I'm glad she's, uh, she did what she did. You, you just never know until that moment. You know, you'll never understand what God's plan is for us. Um, I just know it wasn't her time to go home to him, but I know he has a great plan for her.